be seated. We'll hear argument in 21509, Family Resources Against Teddington Royalty. to the entity that's granting the release, that's being released. 
and here, uh, if you just compare it to Duncan, uh, the word was corporations, and that too has a, a meaning that we're capable of, of understanding and, and employing, uh, but it didn't mean every corporation. And because there was no other specific, ide spe specific identifier, um, the court concluded that it was not, uh, that the party was not released. In that case, it was any corporation whomsoever responsible. The <coughs> court said, look, this is essentially unlimited category. Any corporation uh, whomsoever responsible. Uh, that we, we did, well, there's no connection. To, uh, to, the, to the release here. We're, we don't have any, any corporation whomsoever responsible. We have the predecessors of the parties. There is only one predecessor of Petro Canyon. As to this transaction. As to, as to, as to the, as to the, as to the set of facts that are governed here. There but is the, only one but predecessor. Presumably, there were lots of predecessors uh, with respect to other transactions. That, that is true. But you don't think they, that's included in the process? Well, I think that we can look to the entirety of the clause to determine its meaning. And the clause is very clearly limited to the subject matter, which is the specific square mile of land. So I'm not sure I would concede necessarily that it's limited to those, but that, that well, what informs if, what its if there, What if there had been five prior releases on this track, and, and maybe a couple of them only included a couple of acres of, of this section? Would, would, they, would the people holding those leases be predecessors under your view? Well, I, I think Maybe that the royalty is different, and maybe, you know, they, it's carved up in other ways. If, it, if, I would say two things. First of all, the word predecessor is a broad word, and it means those who come before. But even if you wanted to say uh, there must be but some... But is it the same interest? It, is it the same interest in that situation? It seems like the interest would be different if the lease is different, because... It, you have to be a what you're being a predecessor to is the leasehold interest, right? Not the minerals. Not necessarily, because uh, the the clause here is not tied to the leasehold interest. That is but that's the, the only interest that your client had, and that any of the parties here had, right? They're not mineral interest owners. Well, they were interested. In, I mean, they're they're interested in, as operators. They're interested as as lessees. Okay. So why isn't that the interest that we look at? Well, the, the clause itself says that, it, that, that the clause applies to anything having in any way related to this, this subject matter as stated, but the subject matter as stated is the square mile of land. It would be one thing if the parties had said, uh, we well, right, but you're the one that wants to read in the words in interest. And so, don't we have to define what the interest is? It's not the track. We're, we're not reading anything into the clause. Uh, you know, we're saying that the word predecessor means what it means. It has an ordinary meaning. And, and going back to the question of the, of the Houston, the line of cases from Houston, with the Enchanted, and, and the line of cases uh, that, that this court in Houston Primo reversed, um, each of those cases said we look to rights and responsibilities, uh, that, that perhaps we can define, uh, even if predecessors is something more narrow than its ordinary meaning, we look to its rights, the rights and responsibilities. Here, the plaintiff's claim is to the rights and responsibilities contained within the deed records uh, that uh, that preceded the uh, leasehold going to Finley. And the, uh, those very same rights and responsibilities were transferred to Petro Canyon. So the, the very rights and responsibilities upon which plaintiff is suing in this case are rights and responsibilities that Petro Canyon took on. So they are the direct predecessor with respect to the very basis of the claim that issue. So, but if, if it had only been for half the tract, you would say no. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would, Your Honor, um, because, again, the... For two acres. I, I mean, when does it... When, when do the rights and responsibilities become different? Or if it's pooled with something else? What I'm saying, Your Honor, is under any definition of the word predecessor, we need it. If you, if you give it its ordinary meaning, we need it. We are the predecessor. Uh, we are, we're the ones who operated previously. We're the ones who owned it previously. We're the ones who had the response rights and responsibilities previously. So it doesn't depend on whether the lease that was quit claimed is still, was in fact still valid at that time? Not at all. Not at all. Because, in, well, for, for a lot of reasons. One is that, again, we're predecessor regardless of, of that. 
but was specifically with respect to that. It would, be a, it would be a break in the chain of title if it had lapsed for lack of production. Uh, it would be a break in the chain of title, but it would not know. But it would not not make us a predecessor. We're still the predecessor, whether that title has broken at some point, because we are still the predecessor operator. We're still the predecessor in interest, uh, regardless of whether that uh, that lease had, had terminated. Even if the interest is different. Again, if, you know that, that's a hypothetical. I, I believe it probably would be if if you read the plain language of this agreement, which is that it goes to relation in any way to the loving community. That is how these parties chose to define the interest uh, that they were absolving each other of liability on and went to the loving and tract. So we, the court, of course, is, is well familiar with the, the general rules of construction, which is that we give effect to the party's intent, intent as expressed in the ordinary meaning of the terms they use. There is an ordinary meaning of the word predecessor. It means the, that who came before. And again, under any definition of that, even under the restricted definition of that Houston Court of Appeals line of cases. Well, now this is from the Texas Supreme Court that the, the, the identification needs to be with such descriptive particularity that his identity or his connection with the tortious act is not in doubt. And, and we believe that that has absolutely been met here. There, there is only one predecessor. There is only one potential predecessor in this entire factual scenario. How do we know that if we can't look at formal evidence? Well, uh, an objective fact and circumstance is not, is not uh, parole evidence that a court could consider. I mean, how would you even determine whether to, how to apply the, the, lead, the, the uh, clause if you couldn't figure out who the parties were? I mean, knowing what, whether, who, who's, who the predecessors are is not <coughs> parole evidence. The court has always said you can look to an objective fact and circumstance. Of course, it doesn't alter the meaning, but it forms the meaning. Here, there is only one, and that's what one of the things that the, that the court of appeals to said. It's only ever been leased one time before. No, there's only one predecessor uh, of Petro Canyon with respect to this entire relationship. The well, only I, I thought what you said is if, if there was a lease on this square mile before, it fits a predecessor. Well, we, yes, that's true. If, if okay, there so how many predecessors were there? Uh, there if, it, if it has to be a predecessor in title only, there were, there were a few before this, that's true. Um, but they would, un, even under that reasoning, Finley would still satisfy it because they were the immediate predecessor. So if, if the dispute here were, was whether they were a shareholder or an affiliate or director or officer or representative, your position would be we would always, courts would always have to look at some kind of extrinsic evidence to determine whether the release covered that party, but doing so would not violate the court evidence rule. I think that's correct. I don't see how you could ever apply any contract if you couldn't determine what the facts were. Uh, so here you would simply be applying the provision uh, in determining and in looking to who the, predis who the predecessor is in that instance. So there's also a release of representatives, and this is fanciful, but you might come in and argue, well, that, that, that's a release of my representative in Congress, uh, which is textually, I'm not sure. But that's a special case of representative that, based on the context, we can tell was not intended here. I, I, and I wonder whether predecessor and title is sort of sort of a term of art, a special case of, of a, a particular usage of the word predecessor that is not uh, not often what is meant by by the word when it appears alone. I, I would agree with your hypothetical. There are, certain, uh, there are certain interests or parties or entities that might be so attenuated from the facts of the case uh, that, that it certainly that probably wasn't in the contemplation of the parties if that's what they intended. Here we have well, to... Just, but it's, it's not their attenuation from the facts of the case. It's their attenuation from the, the normal usage of the word. So when you talk about some of these representatives, it, unless you have special reason to think they're talking about their member of Congress, you would never think that that's what they're talking about. Predecessor and title is a little bit like that sort of very special case of the, of the use of the word predecessor. Uh, I, I don't think it is, Your Honor. I, again, the word predecessor, the ordinary meaning of the word predecessor is someone who comes before. Uh, that's the ordinary 
there, and in court after court across America has applied that ordinary meaning. And in court, of course, this court did very similarly in the, in the Primo versus uh, Great American Insurance, where this court was looking to the word successor. And the court said uh, that successor was the person who, was against you, who succeeded, and it didn't have to be a corporate uh, type capacity. And the reason that the court did is it said we look to the, we look also, we look to the ordinary meaning, and the ordinary meaning of succeeds was someone who came after. And we also look to the very purpose uh, and intent of the, of the provision at issue. Here, the purpose and the intent of the provision at issue is clearly a broad discharge of liability. I don't think that anyone could read this provision and think that the parties intended this to have a narrow scope, that, that it was going to be limited to something less than the ordinary meaning of the word. It says, discharges Petrocanon, its affiliates, officers, directors, shareholders, employees, agents, predecessors, from any liabilities, claims, demands, causes of action of whatever character and kind, uh, strict liability, negligence, breach of contract, all related, unknown or known, fixed or contingent, related in any way to the levy contract. But does, this, does that <clears throat> generality help us here? When there, because there's no reference to a specific suit, a specific claim, um, specific other entities that would allow us to sort of give more meaning to predecessors. Because it because it is just so broad. There it, there is a reference. The <laughs> reference is to the Levy County Tax. This is a single square mile of land that the entire transaction, uh, this entire uh, sorry, this entire provision was based on. That is the subject matter of, of the clause. That so is what the insurance about. agent was supposed to write insurance regarding the operations on the track and, and didn't do that for some reason. Is that claim released by your agent? I, I, I'm not sure. Again, I think you could get to the point where perhaps arguably they're really so attenuated that that's not what they meant. They probably meant agents with respect to this particular transaction. So, plausibly. Um, but here, again... Or you could get to the point where you can't say they probably meant one thing or the other, we're just not sure. So it's, it's ambiguous. Assume we disagree with you and conclude that this is just ambiguous. We don't know if the parties meant predecessor in interest or corporate predecessor or both. Assume that's where we go. Is it your position that it then becomes a fact issue on ambiguity, or do you concede that as Justice Plan described our precedent, you lose because it's not clear enough when you talk? Uh, it would be our position that you would remand for a, for a new trial. I don't think that there is. I do, I, I, I do not read the court's 70s and 80s precedent as whole, as, as as, uh, as adopting mechanical rules that say that we're just going to, we're going to turn away releases anytime we're not sure what they say. But I, I, I think that this, this court's post uh, Cessna uh, uh, jurisprudence and Keck and Kessler, um, they, all, they all really bring back some of that uh, expansive language. Didn't we reaffirm the principle in 1997 in a one page opinion? Angus Chemical versus IMC Fertilizer. In this state, unless a party is named and released, it is not released. Uh, I, you know, I think that there, there, I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to go look at that case in McMillan, which was the which was the the, the where that language came from. McMillan was actually talking about Alaska law. So the, the, the that phrase from McMillan. Uh, came from Alaska law. I was saying Alaska says it has to be named and if you're not named. But that's not what we're going to hold. What we hold is that it has to be of some sufficient particularity so that it shows that there's a connection to the cause of action. Here there is an absolute connection to the cause of action, which is there is only one predecessor uh, directly related to this cause of action. The parties knew about it. They were talking about it. There is uh, evidence in the record that they, they, in fact, were fully informed by their own lawyer that, that Petro Canyon's predecessor here was uh, sent. Their own lawyer told them that. They, in fact, in internal correspondence, were, were saying, we don't know why they took off. Uh, it sounds like a remand. If it's ambiguous, would be just looking for you. That's, I mean, in a way, that's absolutely right, Your Honor, because we only think the case gets worse for them uh, if you actually look at the facts. But we don't think the court has to look at the facts because we think that, that it's not ambiguous. This is unique language, right? This is not typical language that you see in, in contract documents that one would guess lease transactions. 
Uh, I, it's, I have not seen a lot of discharges of liability within assignments. Any other questions? Thank you, Council. We'll hear from the respondent. May it please the Lord, Mr. Hastings will present argument for the respondent. <coughs> May it please the court. The petitioners are here asking the court to hold as a matter of law that Headington released Finley for a $54.5 billion claim through a document that does not mention Finley, does not mention this claim that's allegedly being released. It doesn't even mention that there was a dispute between Headington and Finley. Headington says it was in discussed at the closing. Is that true? Uh, Your Honor, what was discussed, the, the fact that this release covering Head Finley, no, that was not discussed. Your Honor, that would be getting into parole, parole evidence, but whether or not this release was covering Finley was not discussed. If it had been discussed, Heddington's answer would have been no. They were not releasing a $50 million claim. This court should be reading the acreage swap agreement and the release in accordance with well-settled uh, principles. And Justice Bland, you're, you're absolutely right about reading Texas law. The law is clear. And it starts with Duncan, Brady, and Kessler. The first sentence of Kessler is a great place to start. And the petitioners keep citing Kessler. The first sentence of Kessler says what the rule is. A party needs to be named or described with particularity so that their identity is not in doubt. If they wanted to try to name and negotiate for Finley, they needed to do more than just a reference to the word predecessor. But in their view, uh, predecessor does that because it specifically identifies a category of released parties. So, for example, insurers is often used in releases. And under your under your construction, could it could somebody come in and say, well, you you by saying insurers, you may have released the primary carrier, but not the excess carrier because you didn't describe the various kinds of insurers that are out there that might be covering the claim. And Your Honor, I want to respond first with the language of the agreement itself, but also the case law. There is no reading of this contract that gets to predecessor, as the petitioners are arguing. As far as the contract goes, it says Petro Canyon's predecessor, the predecessor of Pet Petro Canyon. It doesn't say the predecessor to some part of Petro Canyon somewhere. It says the predecessor of Petro Canyon. Or its affiliates. Or it's affiliates, yes, Your Honor, but it's still the predecessor of the whole entity, not some random part of it. But second, the case law. At the times the parties are negotiating this agreement, the court yeah, you're falls saying it says predecessor of Petro Canyon, not predecessor of the leasehold interest. That's correct, Your Honor. And I will come back to the leasehold interest because even if the court were to go broader than that, it still doesn't help Finley. But I will come back to that. As far as the case law goes, at the time the parties are negotiating this release, you have cases like Falstaff in Enchanted States, which say the classic plain meaning of predecessor in this type of context refers to the entity. Those were before the agreement, but since the agreement, this court in Broadway National Bank says the same thing. The predecessor-successor relationship, classic meaning, is focused on the relationship of those entities. If they wanted it, to, if the parties wanted it to mean something else, they should have included different language. I did think it was a little interesting. This one doesn't say successor. A lot of times we were just like listing all these corporate relations. We say predecessor or successor. Here it only says predecessor, which seems to be in context to uh, uh, support the petitioner's position that the parties knew here who they were talking about, the one and only predecessor in interest. Well, Your Honor. I will agree with you that it's often in context with both words being used. But as the court can look at the case law, for example, the Great American case that was cited several times, they use the word successor. They don't use the word predecessor. It uses successor, but that case, by the way, also includes assigns, so it's a very different fact pattern. So the word, different wording could have been used. But as far as who's the predecessor, this agreement itself tells us if you were going to look at predecessor and title, the petitioners want to run to the end of the agreement to say this is about Loving County traffic. If you read the provision itself, 
It's referring to claims on the Loving County tract, not the parties. But if the court were to agree that we should be looking at the Loving County tract, it's still the agreement itself tells us where Petro Canyon got its title and its rights. So if that's what the parties meant, this agreement on page one and page two tells us where Petro Canyon got its rights. It did not get rights from Finley from a quick claim. A quick claim of nothing is still nothing. And so we're in a situation where the plain meaning of predecessor should lead to the conclusion that Finley is not a have corporate affiliation and is not the predecessor. But even a more expansive reading should lead to the conclusion, if the court were to say predecessor in interest, even a more expansive reading, uh, reading doesn't get the petitioners there because Finley was not the predecessor in interest. There is no reading of this clause that helps the petitioners and gets them to the point that they want to get to to try to get Finley a release. Do you mean because of the lapse? Uh, you're right. It, it, two reasons. One is plain meaning. It's the, just like Broadway National Bank, it's limited to the corporate relationship. If the court were to go beyond that and start buying into the petitioner's argument that you should go broader, then the issue of lapse comes up. So it's only two parts. So you're saying even if we were to read the word predecessor to include predecessors in interest or title, that a family here is not a predecessor in interest or title because it lapsed before the lease lapse, the interest lapse before Petro took over. Absolutely, you're right. And I didn't talk about surrounding circumstances because this is an objective fact. All parties acknowledge that surrounding circumstances can be considered by a court when reading an agreement in context. It's only the objective facts that may be considered. And I take issue with something Petro Canyon says on page 22 of its reply. It says there's no evidence that the Arrington lease terminated. Well, that's just wrong. On page 2 and page 35 of our brief, we cited an extensive amount of evidence to support the lapse of the Arrington lease, including the sworn testimony from Petro Canyon, page 467 of the record, paragraphs 4 and 5, where Petro Canyon's own witness told the district court they determined the lease lapsed, and Petro Canyon's view was the lease lapsed. So that was an objective fact. It's the baseline under which this entire agreement was being negotiated. So when Petro Canyon now says there's no evidence of a lapse, they have completely changed positions and are saying the exact opposite of what they told the district court in this case. Are you saying that if predecessor means predecessors in interest or title, there can only be one? Uh, correct. Well, why is that the case? Because the contract tells us who the predecessor in title is. His predecessors. Well, there's only one. It tells us exactly where Are all Petro of these people our predecessors. I mean, well, that's your honor. That's that's part of the problem. If you read the contract the way petitioners do, you start getting into anyone in the world. If you read the word predecessor in title according to the acreage swap agreement, it tells you exactly where Petro Canyon got its rights and who. Petro Canyon's uh, predecessor was, says it on pages one and two of the uh, acreage swap agreement and identifies it as work. There is no connection between work and family. Is there any agreement uh, between the parties that requires indemnity for claims? Uh, Your Honor, to put that in context, after this acreage, at the time this acreage swap agreement was signed, Headington had no knowledge of any such agreement. There's no evidence that Headington had any knowledge of such an agreement at the time this was signed. But your client did. Uh, Headington did not. Headington did not. Headington did not. But could they have? What we learned about after the fact, so the Edward Swap Agreement signed at the beginning of October, it's put into place. At the end of October, they filed a, a quit claim of record with the indemnity language that's at issue. So that's a fact that the, the petitioners knew did not disclose, there's no evidence, even if you go to all the parole evidence that they cite in this case, there's no one that says we told, uh, we have, there's no evidence to show that the actual terms of that agreement were signed or the indemnity was signed. Eddington's evidence is Mr. Mahan said unequivocally, they did not tell me this point. And so if they had disclosed what they were doing, we could be in a different situation, but they didn't. Petitioners, if they wanted a release, as the court knows, releases are defenses to claims. Usually in court, 
the party asserting the release has the burden to prove that they have a release. The same should be the case for a party who wants to get a release. They need to make sure they get uh, a document that size and covers what they want. If they wanted to cover Finley, they should have put it in the document they did not. <coughs> this court should follow settled princi uh, principles and not change Texas law. If you think about this, these broad readings of predecessor, imagine what that does to settlements. One point we will agree with petitioners on is Texas does have a public policy favoring settlements. That's a policy favoring parties coming together to try to resolve their disputes. If we're going to start changing Texas law and allowing very broad categories to be used when reading releases, how in the world are parties going to be able to negotiate settlements? They're asking for something that's a detriment to the very policy they claim to be concerned about. When, uh, when Finley assigned its rights to Petro's affiliate, Petro, in that agreement, agreed to assume all liabilities that Finley might have did or might have incurred with regard to the love of trial, correct? Your Honor, it appears that they did. Okay, so in order for Petro to fulfill that contractual obligation, did it have to get a release of Finley in its subsequent agreement with LAT? Uh, not necessarily, Your Honor. We, we don't know. That's an issue that ultimately has to get sorted out in the trial court. But what they can't do is negotiate the private deal with it not disclosing what the terms are between the parties. And if you look at the timing, watch the timing closely. The I, I understand that, but I'm just trying to really kind of narrow this down. It just seems to me that if Petro agreed to assume all liabilities to protect Finley when it accepted the assignment of the, of the interest in the trial, then later it enters into this agreement with Heddington, and Heddington may have claims against Finley, wouldn't Petro have had to have gotten a release or other protection of Finley or else be in breach of its prior agreement? Well, Your Honor, I don't believe that they would have had to have gotten a release. And if they're in a breach of their prior agreement, that's an issue between those parties. Well, it know, doesn't make it a release that Heddington agreed. They can't agree among themselves that Heddington's going to give up a $50 million claim. It would be a nice trick if they could, but that's not Texas law. Well, um, you know, we say specifically identify the, 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 the party being released, but we're very general with respect to claims, all claims of whatever kind. And the claim doesn't necessarily have to be recited or disclosed. And so, you know, if, if we have that approach with respect to claims, you know, should we take the broader view of categories and say, okay, a specific identification of a category is enough? Uh, no, Your Honor. The, the def on the claims, as I understand Texas law, it requires a clear articulation of what's being done. It's certainly true that the court, that parties can get to a broad release of claims, but they have to be very clear to do so. It should be the same for parties. If you want to get broad releases of parties, you have to be clear not just taking a word like predecessor, that prior case law has said refers to a corporate member. Do you agree that the standard that would govern releases of claims, the standard that govern releases of parties, is the same? Uh, they're at least extremely similar, Your Honor. They both they should be narrowly construed, as this Court has said, and it needs to be clear language. So I guess, yes, I guess it would be the same. It needs to be very clear. And the policy of making people write their agreements clearly that furthers the ultimate goal of settlement. I mean, what better to effectuate the intent of the parties and the policy of people coming together to resolve their disagreements to at least mention what their disagreements were that are being resolved? But with the, when it comes to claims, we've said that, that our, our principle of describing about these releases um, doesn't require that the parties anticipate and identify each potential cause of action related to the releases subject matter, which seems different from what you're describing in terms of this, this degree of you know, identification of a specific or any other kind of claim that would be released. And, and, Your Honor, that's why I was hesitating a little bit, because I haven't worked through every nuance of how the claim versus the party issue works. When it comes to claims, the parties, if they want 
everything possible covered. They need all that language. We want to cover all claims, known, unknown, foreseen, unforeseen, all of that stuff. Which, which by definition means you can't identify by name every claim that's being released. You, and, you're, you're, and you're being very clear about it. That's the problem. With, when it comes to parties, you're not. If parties wanted to negotiate a release that said, we're going to release Petro Canyon and any person affiliated with them in any way that we could either foresee or not foresee, they might be in a different case. But they didn't do that. They said Petro Canyon's predecessor. And so the plain meaning of that should be looked at as the predecessor of Petro Canyon. If we, if we conclude it's ambiguous, I know you say it's not. He's, that you both say it's not ambiguous, but you have different proposed meanings. But if we concluded both your proposed meanings were meanings were reasonable and therefore it's ambiguous, is it your position that it therefore has to go to a jury or fact finder to determine the party's intent, or do, do Duncan and Brady and our precedent uh, kick in and say, well, then therefore there's no release because it, it doesn't identify by name or with sufficient particular? And your honor, it's the latter. It, it ultimately, for the first time ever in this case, in this court, the petitioners have suggested this agreement as an alternative. I know it's their alternative argument. It might be ambiguous. If the court were to reach that question, and we've cited some cases, I believe, from Iowa and Wyoming and some other state Supreme Courts have recognized, well, if you get to amb ambiguity, you've already lost because it's not meeting the standard. It's not meeting the clear identification standard. So it's like the insurance context where if it's ambiguous, the tie goes to the insured and there's not a problem of ambiguity. Uh, yes, yes, Your Honor. And there are circumstances. I mean, think about it. This court dealt with one in the uh, Energen, uh, I'm sorry, the Endeavor versus Energen case, special limitations in oil and gas leases. When the court concluded this is ambiguous, ultimately because of the way Texas law is, Texas law, just like releases, has a requirement that if you want a special limitation, it must be stated clearly. And because it was ambiguous, that necessarily meant it was not stated clearly. We're in a very similar situation to that. If, if the language had said all predecessors of any kind, would, would that be sufficient to, to capture your client? Uh, your Honor, I do not believe so because predecessors had the case law describing predecessors in the classic meeting. And so I don't believe that would be enough, but that's also not our case. And so as far as you, yeah. you would say that that's any kind of corporate, any kind of predecessor in the corporate context is still yes. what that would mean. Yes, sir. Or alternatively, any kind of predecessor to this particular title which had lapsed. If they wanted to say that, they could have said that, but they did not say title. And so there's two problems. Right, One, but I thought your second argument was even if it was broad enough to include title, that they weren't a predecessor to this title because it because the lease lapsed. Your Honor, you beat me to it. I was about to say there's two points there. One is they didn't say title, but second, if they had, there's a break in the chain of title. And so there's a problem there. And so if you read this release the way petitioners are, we don't know where it would stop. We would not know. Uh, who has been released under this agreement. I mean, you think about it, there was a good hypothetical ask, what happened if only half of the interest was transferred to Petro Canyon? Would that make you a predecessor? I would ask a different one. What would happen if Finley transferred an interest in Dallas to Petro Canyon instead of Loving County? Are they now a predecessor under this agreement? If you follow the petitioner's arguments to the logical conclusion, there's no end. That, if there's no end to terms like this, that would be a huge deterrent to parties coming together to voluntarily resolve their disputes and settle. They're well, undermining the their own principle. The last line does limit it to the Loving County Tract. No, Your Honor. Related in any way to the Loving County Tract. No, Your Honor, because that's referring to the claims. That is the release of what the claims are. And if you look at it, it's not saying we're releasing the agents at the Loving County Tract or we're releasing the uh, employees on the Loving County Tract. It's not the predecessors. On the Loving County track. It's we're releasing the predecessors, agents, representatives on one side of who's being released. And then you look the at the claim. The, the, exactly, Your Honor. And then you look at the other part. But parties. that does limit the universe because there are only there's only a limited universe of people who can bring the claim associated with the Loving County. 
it, it does in theory, but you also have a situation where if there's a transfer of rights, let's say if Finley had never conveyed the Loving County, the Arrington lease to Petra Canyon, but it conveyed something off in Dallas, hundreds of miles away, they could argue that they're a, Petri, they're, um, a predecessor. There's, they still have that predecessor relationship, even though Finley had been on the same track. I mean, you can work through the hypotheticals. There is no end to the, uh, the analysis that the petitions are asking for, which is perhaps the biggest deterrent you can have to trying to get settlements done and would be expressly contrary to this court's precedent. This court should stick with precedent, keep people's expectations settled when they're negotiating contracts and not... When, when you did the, the release, there was an exclusion for pre-existing plugging and restoration of liability respect to the wells. Why would that be necessary if predecessors didn't include predecessors in that? Because, Your Honor, for reasons, it, it, if you look at the record, there's no explanation for this. There is parole evidence where that, uh, Heddington expressed confusion as to why this happened. But while the parties were negotiating the release, there had been no disclosure of the quit claim and the, the indemnity terms, but there was the filing of a P4 with the Railroad Commission. And all of a sudden, Double E was taking over as operator of Finley's Wells. Because of that, in the P4 form, if you read the instructions, that is the designating document as to who's responsible for plug and abandonment. It resulted in a very quick Heddington's not releasing anyone for that liability. Petra Canyon took on that liability. That's their problem. That's why that came up is because of the P4 being filed in the public record. That was the only disclosure. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the Court. Let me address two things. First, about the categorical releases, Justice Brand. You had the most questions on those, Justice Busby. You joined them. And the issue there was, in Duncan, we said you've got to identify the party or a category of parties with particularity. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I think, certainly, Duncan says that. And certainly, in 1997, there were several decisions. Uh, one of them was Kessler, though. And Kessler addressed the very point and referred back to Duncan and said, in Duncan, we have, we have qualified Duncan already. It is sufficient to describe with particularity the released party's identity or the connection with the event. That has given rise to a number of cases uh, in the courts of appeals. Let me just give you a couple of them because they're important. The reason I'm doing this is if you take away categorical release, which is really where Eddington is at, you're going to radically change the landscape of Texas. In Schomburg versus TRW, the release of the unnamed component part manufacturers released the seatbelt manufacturer. In Kiraz versus Jump Street, uh, a release of people, uh, unnamed entities that uh, uh, were released and actually, what the court said was all individuals and the entities involved in the operation of Jump Street, unnamed, completely unnamed. Way to figure those out, I guess, yes. Go look at Jump Street and figure that out. Uh, Tom versus Rebels Honky Talk, uh, that was uh, a, one of the spinning bulls uh, in, in the Honky Talk, and the question was, is the police owner? Well, the court found that those were unnamed. And you had to go look, but there were several owners, and there was even an owner of an owner. They were released. Anderson versus Medtronics. Uh, Randy Crane, South Southern District of Texas, relying on Duncan. And the changes in Duncan that came later and says, look, truth of the matter is, unnamed manufacturers of an infusion set were included in a release that simply identified suppliers of Medtronic. That's what the law in Texas is. You're not going to find another case that carves down on that. We looked. Now, the truth of the matter is, Duncan went far, and Justice Spears was addressing a lot of things. Most of Duncan has been overruled. Rady came soon thereafter, written by Justice Hightower in 91. It follows Duncan, but it was a narrow release. How can I tell you that the narrow and made a difference? The court, because the court said this in two cases, 
first the, the Kate uh, Mahon and Kate case, and then later Kessler pointed out Brady. We carved back Brady because Brady involved very specific release related to one transaction only. And, the re and what had happened in that case is they were trying to get release of different liability. And they said, these releases that are broad, what, what we have here, one and unknown. So so what, is the, what is the standard as you, what do you say the standard is under our current precedent? Under the current precedent, I think the standard is this, that it is names. No doubt about that. Names specifically. If you don't, you list with reasonable uh, description, so a reasonable particularity is how the courts say it. And if you name a category, the category is sufficient. And you have to go look and see what the category is. Let me, just as young, answer your question about the difference between broadness of claims and broadness of uh, uh, who he is actually released. Think about it. In Kate, they had in Kate, what was what the whole settlement agreement about was release of unpaid attorney's fees. What the court determined, this court determined, was what was released was a malpractice claim for things that came later or during that same period. Well, no, actually later. Uh, and that has been consistent with what we have, we have seen. The, that, that doesn't, that's helpful in terms of the general standard, but it, it doesn't seem to help on the application here as much because we still have to figure out what uh, predecessors means in the particular context of this agreement and whether that category is sufficiently clear to include predecessors in title. Let me take on two things. I've got just a few minutes left. First off, we disagree totally with the idea that they didn't know about the predecessor relationship when there was a break in title. The evidence is, is completely different than that. I wrote it down to be able to give you the record sites uh, because they are more important in the assignment. If, if everybody knows about the relationship, right. and in particular, uh, just assume that everybody even knows that you have some indemnity uh, relationship to the predecessor, whose burden is it to make sure that if that entity is going to be included, it is included? Who, who should have come forward and said, and by this we mean that? Well, they take the position of so now. And the truth of the matter is, when you're drafting the documents, it's both parties. This court's in the technical position that it is, if you look to hang the, the and this is in one apartment, that if you look to hang the person who drafted the document, you can only do that if there is an ambiguity. And there, in the break of title thing, one last thing, and I know my time is up, it's a red herring. It's a red herring this regards. Remember what happened. Then what you do, first of all, what happens to Petro Canyon thinks, not certain, thinks that there's a cessation of the money. They top this. They discuss it with Finley. There's a possibility of litigation. What happens is Finley agrees to the sign to avoid the kind of lawsuit you took on in Red Deer and that kind of thing. That was the reason for this. And they knew about it. I would say heading to know. I knew about it, knew that there was an assumption of liabilities on behalf of Petro Canyon, and knew that Petro Canyon thought those were the release. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Kelvin. The case is submitted. That concludes the arguments in the case of Southeast Oregon. Oh, yeah, it's Oh, yeah, it's Oh, yeah. The Honorable Court is adjourned.